Hello and welcome to the Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. I am your host, Radu Palamariu, Managing Director of Elcot Global. Our mission is to connect you to the supply chain ecosystem globally by bringing forward the most interesting leaders in the industry. And it's my pleasure to have with us today Lydia Young, who's the CEO and co-founder of Next Truck. She is no stranger to taking on a challenge. Her latest venture is taking on one of the largest industries alive, the 800 billion trucking industry. And she has brought in some of the biggest venture firms to back her new idea. Next is a technology platform connecting shippers with carriers. And beyond truckload long haul, Next is in innovating solutions specifically for drayage and port operations and uh, is venture backed by investors including Sequoia Capital and Brookfield Ventures. In January 2019, they closed 97 million in Series C, series C funding, uh, bringing them uh, to a total of 125 million in overall funding. Lydia, thank you for making the time and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Absolutely, thank you for having me today. Uh, so let's start maybe with, uh, with the beginning of the story for Next, because uh, as far as we did some research, it's yourself and, and your husband and two engineers that, uh, that got this started, working day and night trying to push out the first prototype. And uh, now, five years later, you were, you were well on your, on your way. So maybe tell us a little bit about the humble beginnings of the stories and, and you know, walk us through to, to what you've achieved after today. For sure. So next is the first trucker centric marketplace where we connect sh shippers with small trucking companies, primarily owner operators of fleets with less than six trucks. So our company mission is really to empower the truck drivers to drive the way they want, when they want and how they want. So we focus heavily on port drainage, pulling containers through the ports. Um, the beginning of the story, yeah, it was actually very humble. Um, my husband has been in logistics for uh, over 15 years and he operated a few warehouses and uh, uh, he was actually running the largest distribution centers for TVs in Southern California. Um, since he's, a, he's running a traditional 3PL company. Uh, my background is e-commerce. Um, I received my MN degree in communication management and I worked for ad agency and then I de developed my interest in digital marketing before I launched my first e-commerce website. Um, so what really triggered me to get into trucking is really one event. So I was actually visiting my husband at his company and a driver from a multi-billion dollar trucking company came to the warehouse to pick up a load. So all he had was a piece of scrap paper with a load number jotted down from a phone call with his dispatcher. And it took our warehouse three hours to search every square inch of the facility to come to the conclusion that this load was not there. So it's really just one incorrect digit that triggers this whole fishing expedition. And it's a huge waste of resources and it was a time of the drivers and the warehouse workers. So we were thinking if, that, if there's another way we can better streamline the whole process. So after talking to many drivers, we came up with Next Trucking, a marketplace that connects shippers with carriers. And we use more matching technology to make the flow of goods from ship to shelf easier for shippers and more profitable for drivers. Got it, well, that's, that's, a, that's a story that, uh, that I can't say is, um, um, is not happening quite often actually, even today. Um, so <laughs> I must, I must admit, uh, uh, such solutions as yours and the, the tech uh, driven solutions are badly needed. I remember myself since we we're on that topic, uh, being stranded somewhere in, in Barcelona recently with a friend and, and he was trying to, to get a load from, um, from one of the major express companies that I will not name for their benefit, I guess. And, um, and he was trying to get that parcel out uh, faster because he had to set up his booth for a conference and, um, and actually they couldn't find it in the warehouse and he had to escalate this issue to I don't know how many managers and two hours later we were, we were able to find it in the warehouse but uh, let's just say it wasn't a very nice process so great to hear that you're trying to, trying to change that and there's, there's a few other companies like yours trying to change that and hopefully very soon we'll have better, better solutions. Um, so maybe let's go a little bit into 
uh, into next trucking and your target customers and the value proposition. And you mentioned Rage, right, which is the first mile, which is made more from, from uh, uh, as opposed to, to longer haul uh, movement of goods, right? So it's maybe from the port to the, to the warehouse or, or the uh, shorter, shorter distance, right? So maybe tell us a little bit, target clients, um, value proposition specifically for, for next trucking. How do you add the most value? Yeah, we primarily, so it's a two-sided marketplace. So we connect shippers with trucking companies. Um, on the shipper side, we primarily focus on enterprise shippers, Fortune 500 companies. Today, we work with hundreds of shippers, actually including six of the top 10 in America. Um, on the carrier side, we primarily focus on small trucking companies, which accounts for 90% of the market owner operators, small fleets with less than six trucks who don't have resources or software and who don't have technologies and who were underappreciated um, in the past. So we wanted to really build technology to empower them. So from a shipper perspective, we really bring transparency to the shippers. They can trace and track the load real time and they can really receive the proof of delivery. It's literally a piece of paper proving that the load is delivered and that the paper has the driver's name on there, the shipper's name on it. But in the past, you know, if a shipper go through a traditional broker, broker has to trace down that piece of paper from the driver and driver has to go to a truck stop to fax that piece of paper over to the broker, broker scan and send to the shipper. The whole process may take up to two weeks or even longer. So it drags the shipper's cash flow because they cannot bill their buyers without that proof of delivery. So with everything digitalized and on the app, so shipper can build their advice a lot faster so they can increase their cash flow. With enterprise shippers, we also provide EBI and API integration so they can use their existing transportation management software, tend the loads through their software to us, we feed the load status back to them. For carriers, we primarily empower small trucking company drivers. So we wanted to allow them to work the way they want at the time that they want. So they can really have the freedom to make their own choices. And the reason why people to choose to become a truck driver is really they wanted to have this flexibility of life. But unfortunately, like even today, most drivers rely on traditional brokers to find them loads via phone call, text messages. And the typical driver will rely on a few, a handful of brokers that they have relationship with to find them loads. And that they don't necessarily find the loads that meet their criteria. So we, we, what we did is really to really predict what drivers want according to their behavior, their historical data, and we put the drivers on the loads that they wanted to haul. So we can really reduce the time that they spend um, negotiating back and forth with traditional brokers and increase their efficiency so they can make more money and haul more loads. And I'm just curious, why did you choose to focus on, on Drage? Because, uh, you know, we have, we have companies, we have other companies that have gone into marketplaces uh, for long, longer haul, right, for, for long distances. You have been fairly specific in starting, and I think now you're, you're, you're expanding into other services, but you have started and you have been, and still are very focused on that first mile, on the drage component. What, what led you to, to decide that? So trucking has five sectors, truckload, less than a truckload, a drage, pulling containers from the port to local warehouse, intermodals from train station to local warehouse, and small parcel. We focus on drayage, which is a $60 billion market, extremely fragmented, lack of technology. And it is, it is also the most difficult and the most complex sector in trucking. And there are a lot of moving pieces and tons of stakeholder and a lot of players in the ecosystem. So containers are put on the ship, then they arrive at a port, go through customs and through terminals and where they're put onto a chassis, then pick up by a driver to a local warehouse. Then the warehouse needs to unload the merchandise and the truck needs to pick up the container and return it to the same or a different terminal. And then you need to make appointment with terminals and make sure you haul the containers out before the last free day to avoid late charges, we call demerge. And uh, the return the container before the free time expired, we call FTE to avoid per diem charges. So there are also different chassis providers 
and uh, a typical trucking company to deal with through the whole ecosystem. And there are different players and chassis. Some of the chassis belong to the you know private companies. Some belong to uh, you know steamship lines. And uh, most of the players in the ecosystem don't share data. So it make the drainage ecosystem super complex and super difficult. If just looking at LA and Long Beach ports, we have two ports, we have 12 terminals and everybody use different operating system, different appointment system, they don't share data. So we're actually very excited to be the first company that address drainage problems and build drainage solutions because 40% of merchandise in our country is imported. And drainage is really the first mile journey of every single imported good. It's, we call it the first domino of the supply chain. If we don't do drainage right, it will impact an entire supply chain. And we're the first mover in drainage and it's super complex. We're building a big, beautiful software that empowered the entire ecosystem drainage. And uh, that's also the reason why we attracted a lot of very talented product engineering data scientists to join the company to build the next generation of a drainage solution that would, that would be one of a kind in the industry. And, and certainly you didn't heard that in your first year I was reading you did uh, 11 million in revenue and you were already profitable. So that's that's quite a, uh, I'm, I hope I'm getting it right, but that's if, if, if indeed you, you reach profitability so quickly, that's that's quite a feat because I think today uh, most, uh, most startups take a long, long time, um, again, not to name anybody, but, but before they reach anything close to profitability. So tell us a little bit about that. How did you manage to, to get profitable so fast and what were the main success factors? I think one is really we focus on the truck drivers because truck shortage is number one problem of our industry. Um, our industry's lack of 50,000 truck drivers at this point may reach up to over 100,000 truck drivers in the next five years. The turnover rate is 97% and people do not want to stay in the industry. So we focus on the the driver shortage problems. We built the solution surrounding the driver's needs. We wanted to aggregate a capacity under our platform and empower the drivers to make them more efficient. So I think that's the direction that we went after is really to put a majority of our focus on the supply side to make sure that Next has enough supply and has quality supply. Because our goal is really to build an apple in trucking. So we wanted to bring in the best drivers, clean that ground, great uh, on-time delivery, great services. And then we formed the largest virtual fleet that could provide consistent, great service to our shippers. Got it. And if I'm to, 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 to drill a little bit deeper, because I'm still, I'm still um, intrigued on the, um, on the profitability side, because definitely offering quality is one aspect and is very important. And 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 to uh, to to get to profitability, because a lot of a lot of companies, especially tech platforms, which we see nowadays, whether it's in logistics or supply chain, or you know, at the larger scale, you have the Uber and the Lyft and the Didi and, and whatnot. They take a really long time to to get there. Um, is there something else that you did on top of the uh, ensuring a high quality of, of drivers that made you achieve that level of making the business already profitable? Um, I think another aspect might be um, focus because, you know, logistics is a trillion dollar industry and trucking is an $800 billion industry. It's very distracting if you wanted to do everything. And it's actually the common, you know, mistakes a lot of company made is really trying to do everything at one time. Uh, when we started, we heavily focused on building lanes and they were very regional driven. So we focused on Southern California home-based drivers first. We only onboarded the drivers in Southern California. And then when we approach shippers, we approach the shippers who have this lane, which means they will ship from Southern California. So we build the liquidity and the supply and demand simultaneously. That saves us a lot of money because just imagine if I bring a bunch of drivers on East Coast at this point, while I don't have East Coast loads. So I can I should either find, you know, spot market loads at lower price. So I will have to take a loss on it, 
or I will churn the drivers very quickly because I don't have loads for them. And the same thing, if I onboard a shipper who have tons of loads on East Coast while I don't have drivers who live there and who take those loads, then I'm gonna churn my shippers very quickly. Otherwise, I'll have to pay a lot of money trying to cover the loads last minute through like traditional brokerage way. So I think being very focused and being very regional driven is uh, it's really something that set next apart from the rest of the players in the market. Mm. Yeah, that's that's uh, that brings me to um, to an example I recently read about a company that that had eighty percent of their revenue out of uh, out of Australia and New Zealand, um, mm -hmm. and still made it to a billion dollar billion dollar status because they were to your point, focused and they, they got really good at, at the product, they have the, um, they have the platform optimized and then they can go globally or regionally fairly fast. Um, and I really like your sharing in terms of, um, uh, you know, in terms of being focused, specific, regional, not going, f you know, not going um, uh, out of your, let's say, uh, out of your focus area too fast and spreading yourself too thin. So yeah. that's, a, that's a great sharing for sure. Uh, what what would be uh, what would be some of the biggest challenges that you face when it comes? To yeah. Big big challenges we'll face in operations. Yeah, what would be your biggest challenges right now when it comes to your operations? Well, we're scaling at an incredible pace. Um, so since June of this year, we've doubled our headcount to more than two hundred employees. So with many new people coming on board, it was a challenge to establish consistency across the board. So to overcome this, we gathered our leadership along with feedback from many of our employees and launched the two sets of core values. So there are six guiding principles for the way we run our business. Drivers first. So I wanted to make sure that the company is really surrounding the first value around our drivers because we call ourselves trucker centric. So driver is really the first, the most important factor for the business. The second, disagree and commit. Focus on the true north, be a change agent, give an untrust and passion to win. So those are the six major values and that is guiding the company and to make sure that we bring the people in that shares the company values and also we can grow our talent base with the same principles. Understood. And when it comes to doubling operations from 100 to 200, that's a major, major shift. And it's also uh, obviously much harder to um, much harder to integrate that many people in such a short period of time and culture and setting a clear value proposition is definitely important. Um, and I'm just wondering, was there something else that you've done or any other principle of fast scaling that you follow on top of making sure that the culture and the value of the companies are, are clear to help you navigate such fast growth spurts? Well, I think like every company, we made mistakes. Um, when we were smaller and the, the company cultures really work hard and get shit down. <laughs> so um, I think when we reached about 100 people in the company, we do see a shift of culture. And we built, then we really assembled a culture committee. So culture committee includes people not only from the executive team, really, you know, we assembled a team that are interesting in shaping the company cultures for next, who are passionate about shaping the company culture. So that includes, you know, mid-level managers, you know, customer service, operations reps, and even some truck drivers. So that's how we really finalized and shaped it. It, it's, it was a pretty long process. Like we, we really spent three months trying to figure out what our identity is what we want ourselves to be and what are values, what are the values that are important to the companies, to the people here. And that is our foundation. So we believe once we have a solid foundation, it's a lot easier for us to scale. And obviously we implement a new training process to onboard new people. We 
build a much bigger product engineering data science team to bring more automations to edge to shorten the new employee onboarding. We have a, a learning and development team to help us really to speed up the onboarding of new employees. And we'll also focus on bringing most talented people who are passionate about what we're doing and who are truly passionate about solving a real world problem. And I'd like to, I, I have a lot more questions uh, for, for next, and I think you're building a fantastic product and you've, you've given us some good pointers, but I want also to cover your personal story because it's a, it's a peculiar one. It's a different one. And I, and the one that I think we should have a lot more in the industry. Um, and you are a woman that, uh, that, that set up a, a trucking based tech company. We don't get to see a lot of, uh, of such uh, profiles. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. still, I think, uh, you know, it, we are on the right track, but it, it's taking us, uh, it's taking us a bit of time as, uh, as we go. So I wanted to, to shift the focus to you personally, Lydia. So tell us, how, how is it for you to be a, a woman in this um, world of uh, truckers and trucking companies and, and shipping lines and shippers and, and all of that? Does it matter? Does gender matter? Did you get any challenges around that? How did you experience it? Ah, that's a good question. Um, yes, it, it's, you know, I think trucking is a male dominated industry and so as technology and you don't really see that many female founders in tech company or trucking industry. So it, so unfortunately, I'm in both of them. Um, well, fortunately, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, both of them. And uh, I'm an Asian woman. I'm an Asian immigrant woman. Exactly. On top um, of it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so I do. And I also have accent. And I'm only 5'2". So if you put me next to a, you know, 53-foot trailer or 18-wheel rig, like, I just look out of place a lot of times. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of challenges in the early days uh, when I pitched investors because they just they couldn't, you know, vision me next to a truck. <laughs> I even got questions like, do you drive a truck? And do you know how to drive a truck? So uh, it was very difficult early days. But I think at the end of the day, it's, we show the hard number to the investors. We do have tremendous growth as a company. Um, that set us apart from the rest of the players. Um, uh, we did have challenges, but uh, I think one thing is I, I do, I'm very persistent as a person and I do work very, very hard. Um, so, and also I'm very lucky that I assembled a fantastic team that is passionate about what we're doing and who's truly caring truck drivers. Um, that's also the reason why, you know, we put the company mission as truckers first, is really to empower the truck drivers. So yeah, I, I, I think overall my experience is very positive. I'm very lucky that I have, you know, investors like Sequoia, Brookfield on my board. They truly care about what we are doing and uh, they, are also determined to really disrupt the straightage sector. And we know we're building something that is super complex, super big. It's a huge product that we're building, but it will bring tremendous value to the industry and it, it can eventually change the industry fundamentally. So I think everyone's super excited about it. Uh, we're definitely doing the right thing at the right time and we have the right people and we're in the right environment. And you, you got me very curious about another element of your uh, personal trajectory because you moved uh, a few years ago from China to the US. So I wanted also to, to, to dig a little bit into the, into the background of that and why you chose to do that and, and what were some of the implications of, of doing that for you. you know, obviously, you set up next in, in US, but tell us a little bit about that, that move. Um, I went to, so. I went to high school called Shanghai, it's a middle school and high school, it's seven years school, called Shanghai Foreign Language School. So, um, and I actually had American education when I was in school. So I was inspired by the higher educations in the US. 
and I always wanted to pursue the higher education in America. So after I graduated from college in China, I decided to apply for uh, a you know higher degree in the U.S. Um, I apply. I actually went to University of Virginia first. Um, I studied Italian, and uh, oh, wow. for yeah, before I transferred to USC to pursue a master degree in communication management. Um, it's it's definitely great benefit for me, uh, personal and career wise, because you know I had the, the education in China that it really focused on disciplines, focused on you know memorizing the knowledges. And I think American education allowed me to be more creative and uh, more open-minded. And uh, I remember in the early days when I was in UVA, my professor actually came to me and uh, was like, Lydia, why I never see you raise your hand uh, in the class? And do you not have any questions or do you not know the answers? Because I was in a culture that is, you know, it's about disciplines and, uh, you know, you should never challenge or ask questions. So that was a really a turning point for my life. It's like, and, and my professor actually forced me to raise my hand every single class. So that was the first time I really became a more independent thinker and trying to be creative and to really to speak up for myself. I think it, it really shaped my, uh, my personality for the next 10 years. And also it built a foundation for me to be a founder of a company. Hmm. No, for sure. And that's, 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 uh, that's quite a story. I didn't realize that you, sp uh, so you, do you speak Italian? Do you still I speak? I, my Italian is really rusted. I can I think I can still read it, but uh, I remember last time I was in Italy and I was trying to speak Italian to a taxi driver and he turned around and he was like, lady, I speak English. <laughs> so I guess it, my Italian was pretty rusted. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe, or maybe the taxi, taxi driver's Italian is, is a slang dialect. So, you know, you, ne you never know, but uh, yeah. <laughs> It's, um, yeah, it's it's a fascinating story. I mean, I, I, yeah. I understand quite a bit of Italian because I come from Romania originally and uh, the language ah, of okay. Romanian and, and Italian is the same root language of Latin, but uh, yeah. fascinating yeah. For, for somebody from, you know, like yourself too. Yeah, because I can also I can kind of guess Spanish as well because it's in the same language group. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's fairly, it's yeah. fairly close. Yeah. And I wanted also to ask you, because you have done, uh, you have been involved in other businesses. You had your own business in, in I think, e-commerce related. How has that also helped you and some of the learnings from those businesses maybe helped you when you set up and you, you started Next Trucking? Yeah, I had another business, which was a flash sale e-commerce company back in China. Um, I was actually the first group of startup that uh, in flash sale in China. Um, I started a business, I remember almost 10 years ago. And uh, we, I had really quick success after we launched this website six months and the company was actually profitable. So I had a very lucrative, happy, small business and I had a very small team and small hardworking team. And, uh, um, and I remember my mar margin was like 75% because I was really the first group of people that were selling um, American fashion goods to Chinese consumers on internet uh, via flash sale mode. So it was a great run. And uh, I think from obviously after six months, uh, basically 12 months after we launched the website, we had tons of competitors and who had the same business model and raised tons of money and they moved a lot faster than us. So from that experience, and I learned really speed is the only competitive advantage. Like we had great ideas, we had great executions, we, had, we understand transportation and moving goods, but we didn't move fast enough. And also we didn't raise money fast enough. So instead of keeping our first mover advantage, we s slowed down at exactly the wrong moment. So, so 
great, great lesson learned um, from that experiences. And so for next trucking, I actually set out to raise money very, very early. Literally when we had a prototype, I set out to raise my first $120,000. And I, I call it the happiest check ever. <laughs> it really got us started. And uh, I remember I was jumping up and down for two weeks for that first check because uh, that was the, my first fundraising experience. And it wasn't too bad. Um, that's got us started. And today, the company has over 200 people. And it grew 100% year over year. It's definitely the, the great journey that we're taking. Mm. And you spoke a lot about talent and uh, and having the right team across your businesses and now in Next as well as in the past. How tell us a little bit about the the challenges of finding and identifying and attracting the right talent to the team because that's never easy. And I've looked at your I mean we do executive search as a day job. Uh, podcasting is our side job. Um, and I um, I just as a uh, how to say, a professional habit. I checked your website for, for roles that you have available and I saw that basically there's two big categories of roles you're looking for. You're looking for data scientists and you're looking for product um, product um, experts. But these two jobs are probably uh, jobs that are being in demand for every industry, <laughs> especially <laughs> the data scientists. So the million dollar question then is how do you attract and find the right talent to come to Next and take the company to the next level? I think in the early days, uh, it was pretty challenging um, because, you know, logistics is so new to the tech talents and a lot of tech talents in Southern California work for, you know, large media companies or, um, you know, we call traditional tech companies and the logistics is very, very new topic. Um, and for me, in I enjoy working with people who are passionate about what we're doing. It's not really to write the ride and, uh, you know, join a company because of the hype. Um, like we, like today we have talents in the office who are truly passionate about what we're doing. And we also encourage our tech team to go on a truck, to sit with the drivers, to spend the day, and to really understand the life of the people. I think the most rewarding moment is when, you know, truck drivers come in, shake our hands, and uh, tell told us how appreciative they are for changing their life. That was the most rewarding moment for the team because we're building something that changing people's life, and it, 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 it is something that has a purpose. So obviously when we were small, it was very difficult to attract the right talents because you really need people to believe in a vision. And also because we are a, a operating company, so which means we, are a, we need talents from both trucking industry and technology industries. So it's a, it's a little bit challenging in the early days when we wanted to really form the company culture. Um, but to be fair, like after Forbes calling us a next billion dollar company, uh, it actually made it a little easier for us to, um, to be more selective when it comes to talents. And now we have really, really talented people join the company. Um, and uh, of course, I think the idea of logistics and the renovating logistic industry is really got out and uh, became a trend. So it allowed us to bring in the best of people um, and who are truly interested in solve the drainage problem. Hmm. And I know that you have, uh, or at least uh, you spoke in the past about having a one particular top million dollar question that you want uh, people to answer during interviews with Next. Tell us a little bit about that, that question and why is it so important? You said my interview questions. Yes. So I was, I was, uh, the team was reading that you, you mentioned you have one top question that you usually ask in an interview uh -huh. um, to make sure that there is a fit with, between next and the and the candidate. And now I don't know what is that question. So I got you got me really curious. Uh -huh. I to see to ask you. Yeah, I do have a set of questions I always ask. Um, 
I think recently I always ask, you know, what is the greatest flaw in your, you know, communication or leadership style? Um, I think I wanted to hear people who give me honest answers because it's very difficult for people to really confront themselves and provide genuine feedback. And also, it also, let me understand that this candidate can really reflect him or herself, right? Because um, I think self-awareness is really a great quality for a human being. Like nobody is perfect. And uh, if we really have self-awareness and we will be able to improve ourselves. So that's why I always ask that question. Mm. Yeah, so true. And, uh, and, and uh, of course, you, you can find online some scripted answers to, to that question. Uh, one of which is, I, I work so hard and, and I'm, I'm so passionate about my job that <laughs> yeah. that's my biggest flaw. And so, uh, so I've read some fun answers, there, which I'm sure that some people actually give. But I totally give, get your point that uh, in general, actually, it's uh, in my experience as well, that the, the bigger the company is actually, the bigger the companies get, the more politically correct they get. And, you know, I, I understand the reasons why, but I think that authenticity, being able to reflect on yourself, being able to be genuine about what you're good at, what you're not good at, um, is quite important because nobody is actually perfect. But unfortunately, I would say in most big companies, that's not really the case. I think people do do, do a lot of pretending. So I'm um, I'm, I'm uh, happy to hear that, uh, that you make it as a very important trait uh, to look for in, in Next. And I think in general, in, in, in smaller companies, it's, uh, it's a lot more prevalent that people are, are, should be more, more, much more authentic. And hopefully one day this will translate into a trait in, in all companies, not just, you know, um, not just segments of it. For sure. I wanted also to, to um, ask you about the topic of diversity, right? So let's come back to you being a woman of Asian heritage in the both tech and, and logistics world. And I don't know where there's less women, but I think in both worlds are quite, quite few. Um, um, so, and it's not, it's by, by no means it's a fight between who has less women. I think we should fight on who can, who can up the numbers uh, better and who can get more diversity faster. But what would be your thoughts? Because um, it's a it's a big uh, I think it's a big question. It's a it's a big topic on the agenda of most companies, if not all companies. And they, they want to encourage diversity. They want to get more females on board and and as part of the tech as well as the logistics journey. But how can we do that? Um, um, what's your what's your thought as firsthand being a woman in that position? Um, I th obviously. Diversity is super important. And next we have uh, over 40% of our employees are women, um, obviously in this male dominant industry. So I'm pretty happy about diversity in the company because you know, uh, women actually bring a different perspective um, when it comes to you know, what trucking is like and how to treat the drivers. Um, and also I think in our company, and we're very unique because we are a, uh, blend of technology and operations, right? So we do have talents from both industries and, uh, and we are creating a very unique culture to really mingle two kinds of talents and, and uh, put them under the same roof and allow them to work together as a team. Um, so we're actively working to build an inclusive workforce. Um, and uh, I think other than 40% of my employees are women and around three quarters of our workforce uh, are considered ethnic minority. Um, so we are uh, definitely a very diversified company and uh, we'll continue to do that. Mm. And if you were to look at, at, um, at the industry in general, and um, again, there's two industries, right? So it's the tech industry and it's the logistics industry. But there's, there's a bit of a, of a low overlap now with the logistics tech coming up. How would you, what, what do you think as an industry we can do more um, to encourage more, uh, more diversity? Are there certain 
uh, in, in, does it start in school? Does it start with role models? Does it start with mentoring? I, I'm, I'm just curious if, uh, because I'm actually actively looking and putting together, and I've initiated, uh, it's a personal pet peeve for me, it's a, in some ways, I mean, I'm actually thinking of, of how to how to put it out there. And I think a lot of people are thinking along the same ways, but we haven't quite figured out, uh, there's no silver bullet, right? I think we should try more things and just discussing about it is one way to do it. But I'm just curious if, if you think as an industry, um, there's more things that, that can be done and what would those things be? Well, I think we definitely can use more of your podcast to, to promote the idea of being diversified <laughs> in our industry and bringing more talents to in the industry. I think with all the technology company coming into the industry, uh, logistics becomes sexier for sure. Um, and also it allows us to bring in a different pool of talents to the industry uh, who bring in different perspective and different talents um, to our industry. So really to move the industry forward. Um, I think one is really um, technology company like us are definitely on the forefront of you know, promoting data sharing, promoting uh, technology, and also we have podcasts like yours and also media, uh, mainstream media that is promoting these ideas. Really, if you look at it, every single industry, logistics was left behind. Like every single industry is more modernized and digitalized. But if you look at logistics, it's, it's the, the biggest industry that got left behind. Um, and there, there's a reason behind it because, you know, 10 years ago, if you talk about logistics, nobody, like, nobody would want to talk to you because it seems so remote to a lot of people, um, even for e-commerce companies uh, or, you know, trading companies, logistics cost was a fraction of their margin. So people didn't really pay a lot of attention to logistics until recently because of e-commerce, international trading. And uh, the visibilities that internet brought to e you know, the trading and the margin is really slim for training companies or e-commerce companies. And all of a sudden people realize that, uh, you know, logistics costs almost account for 10% of their margin. So then, you know, everyone look into the industry and realize that logistics is a trillion dollar industry where there's no technology and it's really, really behind uh, when it comes to technology or automation. So the point is we, it's a great opportunity for companies like us or the companies who are interested in, you know, renovating this industry to come in and play at this time. Absolutely. Final question for me, Lydia. Uh, what would, what would you say that the best advice you got in your career may it be as an entrepreneur, let's, let's put it as an entrepreneur. What's the best advice you got in your trajectory and career as an entrepreneur that could help other people that are considering maybe embarking on a similar journey? Uh, I always use this quote, uh, work for a cost, not for a plus, and seek respect, not attention, because it lasts longer. Wow, I love it. Work for a cause, not for applause. That's a uh... Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant way to say it. Um, <laughs> and definitely, definitely, there's not a lot of applauses in, in startup world. I mean, uh, uh, especially, uh, <laughs> especially at the beginning, uh, maybe, maybe for the very few that make it, but, uh, but in general, it's, it's hard to get those applauses. Uh, not, not, not that easy. Um, Lydia, thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a great pleasure. Thanks for, for joining us and for sharing and for having this open discussion and uh, wishing you all the best uh, for, uh, for the future. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you liked what you heard, be sure to go to www.elcotglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview. Also subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest updates first. If you're listening through a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify or Stitcher, we would appreciate a kind review. Five star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn, so do feel free to follow me. And if you have any suggestions on what, what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me note and if you're looking to hire top executives in supply chain or transform your business of course contact us as well to find out how we can help